Um, I'm Naomi Williams, the co-director of Stories on Stage Davis, and I am delighted to welcome you to season five of Stories on Stage Davis and our season opening gala fundraiser. Thank you all for being here. This is really great. Yay! <laughs> My co-director, Elise Wynn Pollard, who many of you know, and I, along with the incredibly talented and devoted board of Stories on Stage Davis, spent much of the summer planning this event, and we're so glad you're here. Some of you who were at the gala last year may remember that I was not here because I was at a residency um, in Washington State, at a writer's residency, and uh, so I helped plan the event, and then I did not go. And this year, it's Elisa's turn to do the exact same thing. So we planned the event together, and she is at a writer's residency in Connecticut. And I've been getting texts from her all evening, and I know she's really missing us um, and is very much here in spirit. But before she left, she baked a whole mess of cookies for us. And they will be at, and she, her cookies are famous, those of you who are regulars here. And they will be served at intermission. So, um, so you can still enjoy Elisa's company in a way. Um, and those of you who are struggling writers know that when you get one of these coveted residencies, you just, you just go, you know. So um, we wish her a really productive two months. She'll be back in November when I will be gone at my own residency. So anyway, this is why you have co-directors. There's a pretty complete list of thank yous in your programs, and I do hope that you'll look at them. Um, they're very beautiful, for one thing. Our, our board member... Evan White, who's standing in the back there, um, directed, uh, designed these for us. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't call out before we started uh, the Pence Gallery and its staff, especially the director, Natalie Nelson, and the staff person, Tim Barrera, who is in the back there. Hi, Tim. Uh, we are so grateful for the long and very uh, fruitful association we've had with this beautiful, sometimes warm venue. Um, we're really happy to be part of the Pence Gallery. Um, I also want to recognize um, Valerie Fioravanti, who founded our sister series, Stories on Stage Sacramento, and its current director, Sue Statz, who I can't see right now, but I know she's here. Hi, Sue. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for being our inspiration and for being here with us tonight. Um, also, a big, big shout out to our founder, Jerry Howitt, who is um, wandering around in the back there. I don't think she can hear me, but um, she probably greeted you at the door this evening. Jerry curated and organized a silent auction for us also, and before intermission, I'll have her come up here and say a few words about that. So the theme of the evening, we are celebrating this fantastic book, the 2016 Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy Anthology. And we're so fortunate to have Karen Joy Fowler here to introduce two of the authors that she selected for this volume, Will Kaufman and Liz Ziemska. Well, Karen really no needs no introduction to a Davis audience. The author of many acclaimed books, including the best-selling Jane Austen Book Club, which was made into a film that probably a lot of you have seen, and more recently, the novel We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which was a finalist for the very prestigious Booker Prize, and which we presented here at Stories on Stage Davis two seasons ago. Uh, Karen was a longtime Davis resident and is a forever member of our literary community. Those who've been lucky enough to see her in person before also know that she does absolutely terrific introductions, so you're in for a treat. Um, as long as we have Karen with us, however, we didn't want to pass up the opportunity to present one of her own pieces. We selected a very short story called The Black Fairy's Curse, um, which she also allowed us to abridge a little to fit our um, schedule. And actually, all the writers tonight allowed me to abridge their pieces to fit our schedule, so, so thank you. Um, Karen's very imaginative retelling of a well-known fairy tale felt like the perfect way to start our evening of science fiction and fantasy. So before I ask Karen to come up here and just say a few words about her story, I want to welcome back Kelly Ogden, who will be reading Karen's story and who is gracing our stage for the fifth time. I think she has the record at, at our event for the number of appear you know, repeat appearances. You can read about Kelly's many theatrical accomplishments in your program. I got to see her two years ago, I think it was two years ago, in a stage play called There is a Happiness That Morning Is. Was that two years ago, Kelly? And I cannot encourage you enough to run to see whatever she appears in next, I, I, you know, after tonight. Um, tonight she's reading two stories for us, um, Karen's piece, and then after intermission she'll be reading Liz Ziemska's story. Um, but first, please welcome Karen Joy Fowler back to Stories on Stage Davis, this time to introduce her story, The Black Fairy's Curse. Thank you, Karen. Thank 
you so much for being here and thank you Naomi and everybody involved with um, Stories on Stage and everybody involved with the Pence Gallery and Kelly, thank you so much. Um, I'm very appreciative of the good care Davis always takes of me when I come. Um, the story that is going to be read tonight, uh, I think um, I wrote a while ago, so I have to cast my mind back to try to remember what I was thinking uh, at the time. But I'm pretty sure that I had just been told that you could never, ever, ever end a story with, she woke up and it was all a dream. And um, I think uh, I speak for all the writers in the crowd when I say, don't tell us we can't do something. And I think the minute I heard that, I thought that will be the ending of my very next story. So here it is. The Black Fairy's Curse by Karen Joy Fowler. She was being chased. She kicked off her shoes, which were slowing her down. At the same time, her heavy skirts vanished, and she found herself in her usual work clothes. Relieved of the weight and constriction, she was able to run faster. She looked back. She was much faster than he was. Her heart was strong. Her strides were long and easy. He was never going to catch her now. She was riding the huntsman's horse, and she couldn't remember why. It was an autumn red with a tangled mane. She was riding fast. A deer leapt in the meadow ahead of her. She saw the white blink of its tail. She'd never ridden well, never had the insane fearlessness it took, but now she was able to enjoy the easiness of the horse's motion. She encouraged it to run faster. It was night. The countryside was softened with patches of moonlight. She could go anywhere she liked, ride to the end of the world and back again. What she would find there was a castle with a toothed tower. Around the castle was a girdle of trees, too narrow to be called a forest, and yet so thick they admitted no light at all. She knew this. Even farther away were the stars. She looked up and saw three of them fall, one right after the other. She made a wish to ride until she reached them. She wore a cloak which, when she wrapped it tightly around her, rode up and left her legs bare. Her feet were cold. She turned around to look. No one was coming after her. She climbed into an aspen tree. She regretted every tree she had never climbed. The only hard part was the first branch. After that, it was easy, or else she was stronger than she'd ever been stronger than she needed to be. This excess of strength gave her a moment of joy as pure as any she could remember. She went as high as she could, standing finally on a limb so thin it dipped under her weight like a boat. She sat with her back against the trunk and one leg dangling. No one would ever think to look for her here. Her hair had come loose, and she let it all down. It was warm on her shoulders. Mother, she said, softly enough to blend with the wind and the leaves. Help me. She meant her real mother. Her real mother was not there, had not been there since she was a little girl. It didn't mean there would be no help. Above her were the stars, Below her, looking up, was a man. He was no one to be afraid of. Her dangling foot was bare. She did not cover it. Maybe she didn't need help. That would be the biggest help of all. Did you want me, he said. She might have known him from somewhere. They might have been children together. Or did you want me to go away? They went swimming together, 
and she swam better than he did. She watched his arms, his shoulders rising darkly from the green water. He turned and saw that she was watching. Do you know my name? He asked her. Yes, she said, although she couldn't remember it. She knew she was supposed to know it, although she could also see that he didn't expect her to. Does it start with a W, she asked him. The sun was out. The surface of the water was a rough gold. What will you give me if I guess it? What do you want? She looked past him. On the bank was a group of smiling women, her grandmother, her mother, and her stepmother too, her sisters and stepsisters, all of them smiling at her. They waved. No one said, put your clothes on. No one said, don't go in too deep now, dear. She was a good swimmer, and there was no reason to be afraid. She couldn't think of a single thing she wanted. She flipped away, breaking the skin of the water with her legs. She surfaced in a place where the lake held still to mirror the sky. When it settled, she looked down into it. She expected to see that she was beautiful, but she was not. A mirror only answers one question, and it can't lie. She had completely lost her looks, She wondered what she had gotten in return. She was healthy. She was strong. If she could manage to be kind and patient and witty and brave, then there would be men who loved her for it. There would be men who found it exciting. He lay among the blankets looking up at her. Your eyes, he said. Your incredible eyes. His own face was in shadow, but there was no reason to be afraid. She removed her dress. It was red. She laid it over the back of a chair. Move over. She had never been in bed with this man before, but she wanted to be. It was late, and no one knew where she was. In fact, her mother had told her explicitly not to come here, but there was no reason to be afraid. I'll tell you what to do, she said. You must use your hand and your mouth, and I want to be first. You'll have to wait. I'll love waiting, he said. He covered her breast with his mouth. His hand moved between her legs. He knew how to touch her already. He kissed her other breast. Like that, she said, just like that. Her body began to tighten in anticipation. He kissed her mouth. He kissed her mouth. He kissed her mouth. It it was not a hard kiss, but it opened her eyes. This was not the right face. She had never seen this man before, and the look he gave her, she wasn't sure she liked it. Why was he kissing her when she was asleep and had never seen him before? What was he doing in her bedroom? She was so frightened. She stopped breathing for a moment. She closed her eyes and wished him away. He was still there. And there was pain. Her finger dripped with blood. And when she tried to sit up, she was weak and encumbered by a heavy dress, a heavy coil of her own hair, a corset, tight and pointed shoes. Oh, she said, oh. She was about to cry, and she didn't know this man to cry before him. Her tone was accusing. She pushed him, and his face showed the surprise of this. He allowed himself to be pushed. If he hadn't, she was not strong enough to force it. He was probably a very nice man. He was giving her a concerned look. She could see that he was tired. His clothes were ripped. His own hands were scratched. He had just done something hard, maybe dangerous. 
So maybe that was why he hadn't stopped to think how it might frighten her to wake up with a stranger kissing her as she lay on her back. Maybe that was why he hadn't noticed how her finger was bleeding, because he hadn't. No matter how much she came to love him, there would always be a part of her afraid of him. I was having the most lovely dream, she said. She was careful not to make her tone as angry as she felt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Our next reader will be Philip Larea, making his third appearance with us. Philip is a man who wears a variety of hats in the local literary scene, all with great flair and warmth. He's a published poet, runs his own literary series in Sacramento, publishes the annual Sac Voices Anthology, and lends his voice talents to events like ours. We're so glad he's back to read Things You Can Buy for a Penny by Will Kaufman, an author I'm particularly pleased to introduce tonight. The pleasures of the writing life can seem few and infrequent. Indeed, right? But for me, one of the abiding pleasures turns out to be seeing the work of writing friends and fellow travelers get the publication and recognition they deserve. Um, when the, this Best American book, and I, I think, Karen, you have my copy, actually, because um, I came up here with that. It's okay. I'll get it later. When, um, when that... When, <laughs> well, I want you all to sign it, so it's okay if you hang on to it. Um, when that Best American came out last year, I wandered into the Avid Reader and opened the table of contents, as one does, to see who was in it. And there, listed on the same page as Salman Rushdie, was my UC Davis classmate, Will Kaufman. His work has just gone from strength to strength in the decades since we both earned our master's degrees down the road. I can't wait to see what he does next. We're going to ask him to come up and tell us a little about his story, but first, let's hear from Karen about her selection of things you can buy for a penny for the Best American Anthology. Thanks. you again. And Kelly, I told you <clears throat> that the story was going to sound a lot better to me with, with you reading it than it ever had before, and that certainly turned out to be true. Um, the way the selection process worked, first of all, I should say that I feel, I feel awkward about the best of title. I think, you know, a more honest title would be Karen Joy Fowler's favorite stories from last year. Um, <laughs> It's not exactly the same thing, much as I might wish it were. Um, but the way the selection process worked was um, John Joseph Adams is the permanent editor of the collection, and there's a guest editor every year. So he read about 500 stories prior to passing on to me 80, uh, from which I think I got to choose 20. Um, and that was, that was both good and bad, because I could not have read 500 stories. Um, I'm not quite clear how John Joseph managed it, but um, that was the good news. The bad news was that the 80 I got were all quite good, and so there was nothing that was easily dismissed. Um, and all of the author's names had been removed, so the idea is that I would be making blind selections. And in most cases, this did turn out to be the case. Um, but Will was a student at a workshop that I taught um, and had turned this story in my week. Um, so um, try as I could to pretend never to have read it before and to have no idea who had written it. Um, I could not quite manage that. As it turned out, um, Will actually had two stories in contention for the collection. So the tricky part turned out to be choosing between those two stories, both of which I loved very much. I did find, um, in a way I, I probably need to think about longer before I can truly articulate it, that in general, in making my final selections, in, in choosing 20 out of 80 really exceptional stories, um, it often came down to the ending. 
that, that a lot of the stories seemed to me equally strong when they began, but the ones I chose were the ones um, that ended in a way that just was either surprising or satisfying or moved me somewhere new from the story. And so in a way, the really accurate title would be Karen J. Fowler's Favorite Endings. <laughs> <laughs> Last year's science fiction and fantasy stories. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you so much, Karen, for teaching that workshop um, and then selecting the story, and Naomi for having me. Um, I'll let the story speak for itself uh, for the most part. Um, so what I'll say about it is that I think, for me, the story is a great example of, of two truths of writing. One is the importance of a great community. Um, this story came out of the Clarion workshop, where... I had a fantastic community of other writers who were incredibly supportive to work with, uh, and it was through conversations with them and, and through just the, the wonderful inspiration they provided that, that this story came about. Uh, and the other part uh, is it's also a testament to just sort of sitting down to doing the work, even if you're not entirely sure what you're going to do. Um, this was a six-week workshop, and we could turn in a story every week, and I had signed up to do so and had no clue what I was going to turn in and literally sat down the night before uh, until something happened. Um, so I think those are both good truths for any writer. Have a good community and sit down every time to just try and do the work. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm excited to hear this. <laughs> Things You Can Buy for a Penny by Will Kaufman. <clears throat> Don't go down to the well, said Theo to his son. So, of course, Tim went to the well. <laughs> he was 13 and his father told him not to. There was no magic to it. <clears throat> to get to the well, and, and not the well at the center of the village because everyone knows where the well is and no one has any stories about it except for whose grandfather dug it and how soon it's going to go dry. You've got to go around to the butchers, to the bottom of the muddy slope at the edge of the wood that the butcher says he doesn't throw his offal down. Everybody knows that the butcher throws his offal down. So the wet gentleman will not eat the butcher's daughter. At the bottom of the slope, look for the bones of the burnt cottage in among the willows. Then look for the moon. You know this only works at night, right? <laughs> the wet gentleman won't come out during the day. Walk towards the point halfway between the moon and the cottage and eventually you'll come to the well. Tim sneaked from his father's house with a penny in his hand and his dog at his side. A dog that he loved because it would never lie to him or trick him. That he would play with even when the other children invited him to join their games because when he told the other children to follow him or wait for him, they would laugh and run away, but not his dog. <laughs> when his father talked, tucked him into bed, it was his dog he asked for a last kiss goodnight. <laughs> its cold nose snuffling at his cheek, because his dog never told him what to do, or sent him to bed without his dinner for not minding because what do dogs know? Maybe if Tim had been a king or a god, he could have loved the other children or his father. What happened to Tim when he went to the well? You must know how the story ends, or rather that it never ends. Surely you've heard about the others who went to the well, like Ma Tathers. When Ma Tathers went to the well, 
She got just what she paid for. She heard about the well because of what happened to Miser Horton. So she knew that the wet gentleman lived there and would grant wishes if he were paid a penny. Miser Horton went because he knew the story of little Suzanne. And both of them got just what they paid for too. The story says Ma Tathers was so old when she walked the path between the moon and the burnt up cottage that her dugs dragged in the dirt. That's not a kind way to describe an old woman, but <laughs> stories are seldom kind, especially to poor women in tattered house coat, which was her only coat, which she wore thinner and thinner as she sat day after day patching up other people's clothes for pennies. Her eyes were milky, and she had to bring the cloth and the needle right up to her muscled nose to see what she was doing. Her grandsons, who she was raising because their parents had died, would say to her, Don't stick that needle so close to your eye, Grandma. You'll poke it out one day, it'll fall right out. <laughs> That's no trouble, Ma Tathers would say. I always got the other one. <laughs> what she meant was, if my eyes were worth a few pennies, I'd sell it right from my head. Even though Ma Tathers had heard the stories, the same stories you've heard, and knew better than to think she could trust the wet gentleman, she did not know what else she could do. She would never take charity, even when it was offered, as though some bone in her body, maybe her fourth rib or left shin, was so stubborn or proud it made her shift her ponderous breast, lift her swollen leg, and turn away from any helping hand. Without charity, and with her eyes going, and her grandsons getting bigger and needing more to eat every day, Ma Tathers didn't see where she could afford to buy what she needed to buy, but from the wet gentleman. The day she decided she would go to the well, Ma Tathers worked as fast as she could, the needle fleet in her crooked fingers. She stitched up every shirt and every pair of pants she could coke from the villagers. But that night, she had fewer pennies than she'd earned the day before. Just four dull coins sitting on the rough wood of her bare table. Spending one that night would mean three pennies for the next day's meals. And while the boys might not complain, their stomachs would grumble mightily. Of course, their stomachs would never grumble again once Ma Tathers got what she paid for at the well. So she walked the moonlit path and she dropped her penny down the dark stone mouth of the crumbling well. Instead of the ringing of a coin hitting stone or the plop of metal falling into swampy muck, Ma Tathers heard the squelch of wet silk and the pattering of dripping water. The wet gentleman emerged from the well top hat first, eyes hidden, shadowed from the moonlight by the flat brim. His face was long, home to a wide mouth that turned down at the corners. His suit was fine silk, his shoes shined even in the night, and he leaned on an ivory cane. All his raiment was soaked through, and water ran from all the creases, and a puddle formed at his feet. He was very tall, very thin, and Ma Tathers had not really expected him to exist. The wet gentleman spoke with a voice deep and cold as his well. He said, How does this night find you, madam? 
I am tired, said Ma Tathers, who answered plainly. The wet gentleman said, You are tired? I have been down this well since the first brick of your village was laid, soaking in cold water, waiting for the night someone drops a penny on my head so I can crawl out and grant them a wish. But I forget myself. A gentleman never complains. Do tell me more about your troubles, miss. Is it true, said Ma Tathers, what they say about Miser Horton and about little Suzanne? The top hat bowed as the gentleman looked Ma Tathers up and down. Surely you didn't spend what must be one of your few pennies to hear a story. No, said Ma Tathers. I came because my grandsons are hungry and I will not be able to feed them for much longer. So, you wish to be young again, said the wet gentleman, and he took her hand. Music came out of the well, pipes and strings. No, said Ma Tathers, but the wet gentleman spun her and ice-cold water ran down her arm and her feet felt light and her joints did not ache and her back was straight. She knew the steps to the dance he led her on. For selfless reasons, he said, so you might live long enough to care for them until they can care for themselves. No, said Ma Tathers, but her hips swayed and did not pop or creak. How much easier would it be to raise two young men if you no longer hurt just from standing? If you could wash a pan and not feel like lying down and sleeping for a week? No, said Ma Tathers, and she broke his grip. Her body sagged as the weight of years fell upon it again and pain settled back in her bones. I know your tricks and I know your bargains. So whatever the price for my wish, it must be paid on me and not on my boys. Even though he had been out of the well for some minutes and even though he had spun with Ma Tathers, the water dripping from the gentleman's clothes had not slowed. The wet gentleman said, Tell me, Joanna Suzanne Tathers, tell me your wish. Make sure my grandsons are fed. They can figure out the rest. I've taught Theo to sow and the house is mine and theirs when I am dead, the sole property of my family. Make sure they have enough to eat until they are able to earn food for themselves. And what price do you think I will ask? Have you not paid me my penny? You will weave spells of deceit. You will make something good into something evil by your trickery. Instead, I can take anything of my body, a meal for a meal. I have heard of your appetites, how the butcher leaves you awful so you will not eat his daughter. Some stories are just stories, said the wet gentleman. But very well, I will feed your grandchildren and I will not ask any payment of them for those meals. He held out his hand. Do we have a deal? She took his hand and shook it firmly. And then she quailed and began to shiver. What, she said, will you do to me? The corners of the wet gentleman's mouth twitched upward. When Ma Tathers wandered back out of the woods in the morning, she could not recall the village or her house or her grandsons or even her own name. The wet gentleman ate all those memories. Her grandchildren brought her home and asked her if she felt ill, but when she opened her mouth, all that came out were stories about the wet gentleman who lived in the well. 
The boys fretted and cried, uncertain and afraid and hungry from only having the three pennies worth of food that day. But then a knock came at the door. And when they opened it, they found a basket full of brown bread and hard cheese and cured sausages and even two apples. With a meal in them and with a few morsels coaxed down their grandmother's throat, the future seemed ever so less frightening. The boys went on, as people do, and ate their meals and cared for their grandmother, who did nothing but tell stories about the wet gentleman until she died. One of the stories she told was the story of Miser Horton, a man so mean with his pocketbook that when he went down to the well he stole the penny to pay the wet gentleman from the shoe of a boy who had left it behind to climb trees with his friends. Miser Horton strode through the woods holding up the hem of his cape so it would not get dirty and need to be cleaned, or snag and tear and need to be mended. The cape was velvet and very old. Taken as partial payment for goods Miser Horton had sold decades earlier. He would proudly tell you the story of that deal if you asked, and maybe even let you touch the cape in question. Miser Horton knew little Suzanne's story, but he, like all the rest who have heard stories and have followed the moonlight path with pennies in their hands, did not expect the wet gentleman to climb out of the well. Miser Horton recovered quickly from his shock, thanks in part to his immediate disdain for the wet gentleman's lack of care with his clothes. Did the man not know what water did to silk? How does this night find you, sir? asked the West gentleman. Jealous, said Miser Horton, getting directly to his business. You are jealous, said the wet gentleman. I have been down this well since the oldest tree in these woods was just a sapling in the cold and wet and dark, while above me people live in warmth and dry comfort, and I only get to visit when someone drops a penny on my head. But I forget myself. A gentleman never complains. Tell me more about your troubles. My wife has made me a cuckold, said Miser Horton. Me, even though I gave her a house and an allowance and children, she has been sneaking out of my bed when she thinks I am asleep. So you would like to be handsome, said the wet gentleman. And he reached out to place a hand on Miser Horton's shoulder. Horton stood taller, his stomach receding while his chest and arms strained the seams of his shirt. His scalp itched and thick locks of hair drooped down over his brow. From the well came the voices of women calling to him, sighing his name. No, said Miser Horton. To win back your wife, said the wet gentleman, or make her jealous when all the other girls throw themselves at your feet and beg to take her place in your bed. Miser Horton said, no, and knocked the wet gentleman's hand from his shoulder. He sagged, his chest and arms draining into his belly, which expanded until his belt cut into it, and his scalp crawled as the hair slid back under the shiny scalp. Miser Horton brushed at his cape, hoping the water would not stain the velvet. He said, What good is being handsome? No one pays to look upon a pretty face. 
Yet you have paid to look upon mine, said the wet gentleman. Let me earn your penny. Tell me your wish. <clears throat> Punish whoever stole my wife from my bed, said Miser Horton. Make him poor. Make his family poor. Make any children he may have poor for the rest of their lives and their children too with nothing to their family's name but the meanest sort of a shanty for a home until the end of his bloodline or the day of reckoning, whichever comes first. Very well, said the wet gentleman, and he offered his hand. Miser Horton regarded it suspiciously. This is no small service you offer me. What price must I pay? You have paid me a penny, said the wet gentleman. If I cannot deliver, you will have only lost the penny you already threw down the well. And you may find some other way to punish the man responsible for your wife's infidelity. Miser Horton took the wet gentleman's hand and then felt a chill on his shoulders. He reached up to pull his cape close only to discover that it was gone. And his shirt had turned from fine cotton to rough wool. What have you done, he asked, and looked into the wet gentleman's face where he saw the corners of that wide mouth flick upwards. Do you not see Horton Tathers, said the wet gentleman. You are responsible for your wife's infidelity. You, with your petty jealousy and greedy character. Now go home to your shanty and tell your children the cost of doing business with the wet gentleman in the well. Horton did just that. And one of the stories he told his children about the price you must pay the wet gentleman for a wish was the story of little Suzanne. Little Suzanne lived in a cottage in the woods near the village with her mommy and daddy and her cat, Tugs. She loved Tugs very much. When mommy and daddy filled the cottage in the woods with terrible shouting, little Suzanne would pick up Tugs and take him outside and lean against a willow and hold him and pet him until he purred, then press her ear against his chest so all she heard was his warm, soft rattle and not the terrible shouting. One day, her daddy threw a chair at her mommy and it missed and hit Tugs instead. And Tugs yowled and scrambled about with his front legs, his hindquarters dragging on the floor. Daddy grabbed Tugs by the neck and took him outside, and when he came back, he didn't have Tugs with him. Little Suzanne asked where Tugs had gone, and Daddy said he tried to help Tugs, but Tugs had run off in the woods. After crying for a week, little Suzanne decided to go to the wishing well. Maybe she knew about the well from even older stories or maybe from exploring the woods, from taking children's paths over the ground and through imagination. Maybe you would know about the well too, even if you had never been told. Little Suzanne took a penny from her father's coin purse while he was snoring and tiptoed through the door, careful not to let it creak or slam, and walked down to the well. She threw the coin in and almost screamed when the wet gentleman's top hat poked out over the edge, followed by his shadowed eyes and wide, downturned mouth. The wet gentleman bowed to her and said, how does the night find you, miss? Scared, said little Suzanne, being truthful and lonely and sad. 
I understand, said the wet gentleman. I have been down this well since your holy books were only dreams and firelight tales. That's a long time to be lonely and sad and scared. You're very wet, said little Suzanne. Would you like me to bring you some clothes? My daddy has three shirts and he might not miss one. That is very kind of you, said the wet gentleman. But it would only get wet again, because I must go down the well once I grant your wish. <clears throat> oh, said little Suzanne, if I don't make a wish, can you stay up here? That is not the way the story goes, Susanna Joanna Smythe, said the wet gentleman. I must tell you that a gentleman never complains, and you must tell me your wish. Little Suzanne tucked a toe into the dirt and mumbled something under her breath. You are scared. I understand that said the wet gentleman. Would you like to be a grown-up so you can be brave and sure like your mommy and daddy? He knelt down in front of her and took her hand as his and she grew and her hips and breasts swelled and she stood down looking at the wet gentleman kneeling and holding her hand. No, she said. You can leave your parents' home and find a man to marry and live with him and never be lonely or scared again. Mm -hmm. Little Suzanne felt something else. She felt a stirring inside of her that was hot and safe and terrifying and awesome and hopeful and fearful all at the same time. From the well came the sound of a babe crying for its mother. No, she said, and she pulled her hand free. She shrank back into childhood until her eyes were level with the kneeling gentleman, water dripping from his hat and from his jacket, and the corners of his mouth twitched downward even further. I want tugs back she said. I want him to purr to me and keep me company until I die and... Yes, said the wet gentleman. And I want mommy and daddy to stop fighting. Two wishes, said the wet gentleman, standing so that he towered over little Suzanne. Have you brought two pennies? No, said little Suzanne. Do I have to choose? The wet gentleman tilted his head back and considered the stars through the leaves of the trees. You do not have to choose, he said at last. One wish will be yours, and one will be mine. You shall have your cat, and your parents will fight no more. Thank you, said little Suzanne, and she hugged the wet gentleman round his legs, which were stick thin and hard as rocks inside his suit, and she got all wet up the front of her nightclothes. Thank you said the wet gentleman, for the penny. Now go home. As she walked home, little Suzanne saw a flickering orange glow through the trees. She heard a roaring, a snapping and popping. She smelled wood smoke and something else, something oily and black like when mommy burned the bacon. 
her house was on fire. And the heat singed her hair and dried her nightclothes. As she watched the house burn, Tugs stalked out from the woods and twined himself around her legs. She picked him up and held him to her ear. But even though she could feel the shudder of his purring, all she could hear was the fire. That's how the villagers found little Suzanne when they ventured into the woods to investigate the fire. A family took her in, and she grew up in the village, always with her ageless cat at her feet or in her arms, and she married a good man with kind hands and a sharp mind. And one day, she felt the stirring inside of her and remembered looking down at the wet gentleman on his knees at her feet and knew she was pregnant. She had many children and told them about the wet gentleman in the well, that he was very powerful and very dangerous and not to be trusted except maybe sometimes. Because after all, Tugs stayed with her and purred for her until she died. Whereupon he climbed onto her still chest, turned round three times, and curled up and died as well. I was buried with her. Her family's fortune rose over time until Horton Tathers inherited the estate. Then the family was poor. But the family never stopped telling stories about the wet gentleman. Horton told them, and Joanna told them, and Theo listened to his grandmother but did not believe her, at least not until the day Theo and his wife could no longer pretend she was anything but barren, and Theo went into the woods. He took the path between the moon and the burned up cottage and he threw a penny down the well and the wet gentleman climbed out of the well and said, how does this night find you, sir? The wet gentleman said, you are troubled. I have been down this well since before people learned to bake bricks. He listened to Theo's troubles and said, so you would like a new wife, one who is young and fertile. When Theo finally refused him, the wet gentleman said, No, very well. Tell me your wish. And the wet gentleman said, I see you've paid attention to the stories, but you mustn't worry. All I really want is a penny now and then, and I know I'll have another soon enough when your son comes to visit me. Theo went home, frightened, doubtful, half convinced it had been a dream, and in a few months his wife woke up and ill and felt the stirring inside her. When their son was born, they named him Timothy, and Theo told Tim the story of little Suzanne, and of Miser Horton and Ma Tathers. Theo told his son these stories to warn him so the boy would know better than to ever go down to the well. Tim said, Why did none of them simply wish for the wet gentleman's power? You could do whatever you want and you'd only ever owe yourself. And you wouldn't ever do anything bad to yourself or trick yourself. And Theo took hold of his son's hands and said, don't go down to the well. <laughs> you already know what will happen next. And you could leave this story while Tim 
sneaks down to the butcher's, his loyal dog at his side, and a penny in his hand. You can leave while the wet gentleman waits in the place that exists beneath the mouth of the well, his face split by a grin. You can leave this story while the wet gentleman thinks about the many pennies he has gathered, pennies that are copper, pennies that are bronze, pennies that are small shells or glittering stones. And how long, how long has it been since he went down to the well? A boy clutching something that once upon a time stood for a penny. He has grown so much since then and worn the finery of so many ages. And through all that time, he has remained a gentleman. Soon, soon he will be a boy again. A boy who will very much hate taking baths. And you, you who get exactly what you pay for, there may be always be some other wet gentleman waiting for you to throw your penny into the well. But you can leave any time you want. There is no magic to that. Thank you.